Keeping it activated. Welcome, Andy Hayner. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, is this on? You can hear me out there with speakers? Okay, very good. Well, I uh, appreciate everybody um, setting aside three days of your life to be trained and equipped in the uh, not only understanding the message, but walking the message of the dominion that we have in Jesus Christ out, um, out in the world. That's really what this is about. How many of you have already uh, become familiar? You've, you've gone through a conference either online or in person with Curry Blake, the DHT, uh, or the new man training. Okay, most people in the room. Very good. Well, um, I'm not here to so much teach you new stuff uh, as much as it is to um, build upon that and to help uh, uh, you to be able to walk this out, okay? So if uh, I, I want to let you know that if you hear, if you think you hear me saying anything that contradicts something that Curry Blake teaches, uh, I'll guarantee you one, th one or two things. One, you either un misunderstood me, two, you misunderstood Curry, or three, you misunderstood both of us. <laughs> uh, and so what I'd like you to do, if you have any questions or areas of confusion that arise uh, over there on the cajon, uh, which is that box with the basket on it, there are some white index cards. I want to encourage you to use the white index cards for any questions that you might have. We're going to have an awful lot of interaction, um, but if you want to ask a question, make sure that it gets brought up. Um, please go ahead and fill out a, a question and just drop it in the basket. The orange index cards because they're the color of fire, we're just going to reserve those for testimonies, and I'll share with you how, uh, how to use those and when to use those and what for um, later on in the conference. Um, during this conference, we are going to be uh, going through the New Creation Activation Conference Manual. Those are available back on the bookstore. Uh, if you didn't have an opportunity to um, pick one up and you know you'd like one and want to even begin to take notes, they're $15 a piece. Um, you, know, you can just raise your hand and somebody can bring you one now. You can settle up at the bookstore on the break, so I'll trust you for it, okay? Or you can turn it back in and say, well, nah, <laughs> it's fine. Um, so if you want one and, and don't have one yet, just raise your hand, somebody will bring you one, and you can go ahead and start using it to take notes, um, or turn it back in at the break. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and, and give you an overview of what this conference is going to be, what we're going to cover, and how we're going to cover it. So the idea behind this conference is, is if, if I were discipling some Someone. someone just came out of the church or just came to Christ um, and needed to be established in who they are in Christ and how to walk in His fullness, this would be what I would cover with them um, in a personal discipleship relationship. I wouldn't necessarily cover it with them in a lecture format, but we would do a lot of hands-on. So this content is what I would cover with them uh, over the next three days. Um, and so... Uh, what we're going to do is lay a foundation of, of our identity in Christ. And we're going to not only lay that foundation of our identity in Christ, but we're going to give you some handles how to experience this in your everyday life so that you can begin to not only know that Christ lives in you and you live in Christ, but that you can begin to experience the Christ who lives in you as your life. Amen? Uh, and then we're going to go on to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the, minute, the activation of your own own pr heavenly prayer language, either how to experience that personally um, or how to minister this to others. And so some of you may say, oh, this is kind of review for me. I want you to be listening to it through the lens of how can I equip someone else to do this as well? Because we're not only going to be disciples, but we're this is really about becoming a disciple maker. Amen. And so part of the way that this is uh, going to going to transpire besides uh, just the content of that. We're going to move on to healing. We're going to move on to prophetic evangelism. We're going to move on to how to talk to other people about Jesus. Uh, and then we're going to tie this all together with discipleship. So the way that I like to look at it is that you've got a, your identity is kind of like the tool belt. Everything hangs on your identity in Christ. Amen. Uh, and then you have a number of tools that you can be able to express and release the impact of the kingdom to everyone 
everyone else. But how many of you know everybody with a two belt and tools doesn't know what the heck they're doing? So we want to have the blueprint of being able to make disciples, to launch new moves of God wherever you go, to know how to, to move from random acts of kingdom to actually unleashing a move of God that impacts a region for, and, and beyond for eternity. Um, that's At the end of this conference, that's what you're going to do. And so, by, um, and so how we're going to do that is we're going to tackle each subject and we're going to have some teaching time and then we're going to trans, uh, transition into the next session following that into hands-on application. We're actually going to have activities. So this is not going to be straight lecture. It's part of the reason that this is not broadcast. There's a lot of interaction that's going to happen. So if you're used to sort of coming into church or a conference and it being a little bit like you know attending a movie theater or a lecture or something like that, this is more going to be like coming into the gym, right? And I'm going to be coach, and I'm going to go up. You know, everybody. You know, we're all going to be doing stuff. So you need to kind of get your minds wrapped around that. Now today is going to be probably a little less hands-on than the remainder of the days. The the it's going to get more and more and more hands-on as we go through this. Um, but as Todd mentioned uh, in the announcements, one of the most essential things uh, elements about this whole conference is that there are people here who have um, a degree of competence and confidence in being able to minister the kingdom on the streets already. And part of the reason that they're here is not only is, is that they're going to get encouraged, but they also want to be available to help get you activated. And so when we have these uh, lunch breaks, we're going to have extended lunch breaks, and I call them lunch and love in action, right? So we're going to have the opportunity. Um, you're going to be uh, able to get some confident people with you and watch how they do it, learn from them, kind of be with them, be them to be together. And they're going to be able to help you get involved and start doing the same thing. So you're going to have opportunity um, to, to do this. And then after the conference stops at 5 p.m., uh, for those that are here in for the conference ready to go, if you want to say, hey, you know, who's interested in, in eating dinner together and maybe doing a little bit of outreach even this evening, uh, there are going to be people um, that you can connect with. So by the time this conference is over, you've got three days and six hours outreach opportunities so you should and each op, outreach opportunity is two hours so six times two that's 12 hours of hands-on ministry plus all the stuff that we're going to do together in the group so you have those um, safe environments where we're actually practicing with one another uh, so you're going to have a lot of opportunity to actually get involved and start doing ministry together um, but that all has to be rested upon the foundation of the world and word amen you, can't just, you don't want to just get out there and start doing stuff and not understand what, what you're doing or why you're doing it. You have to really be able to base it all on that. So we're going to start off this morning um, and just uh, uh, hit the first subject. We're going to cover it in the Word. And then the following session after the break is now we're going to start, okay, how do you experience this? How do you make it real every day so that now, now that I know that I'm a new creation in Christ... How does that affect, for example, the way I have a quiet time? When I have time with God, how can I actually step into that experience morning after morning after evening after day so that I'm living in this experience of the, of the life that Christ has put in me? So if you've got a manual, uh, we're going to turn to the first chapter, um, page 1. If you don't have a manual, one of the key verses for this section is going to be Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Uh, and that's probably one of the key verses for this. It says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Amen? And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, an heir through God. So, here's, uh, here's where everything starts. When I first became a Christian, um, the way the gospel was presented to me and, and uh, over and over and over is that you need to believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can go to heaven when you die. You know, And for about six months, I just lived off of the, the gratitude of, man, I'm not going to hell anymore. Thank God I'm forgiven. And God was so real in my life. But then I started being like, so how do I live the 
rest of my life. I mean, I was 19 years old. I've got a long time between now and the time I'm going to die. So now what do I need to do? And guess what? I had people around me who started kind of looking at me. You know, it ain't just enough to get forgiven of your sins. You need to change this. You need to change that. You need to change the other. And uh, before I knew it, I started coming under, uh, you know, I had a lot of things about how do you grow as a Christian? Well, the thinkers wanted to get me involved in a lot of neat Bible studies, you know. Oh, there's these end time charts and, you know, we got it, you know, and that was really intriguing. And uh, and then the the the, the more the, the religious people who kind of grew up in church, they was looking at me and thinking, you know, you, you're a Christian and you still listen to that music and your hair is how long? I actually had long hair. <laughs> and uh, you got an ear pierced and, you know, I had all, you know, and so they wanted to clean up my life that way. That was their version of growing in the Christian life. And after a while, I was like, so, you know, what is it to grow in the Christian life? And, and the, there was a campus ministry that I got involved in, and they were all about the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines. You need to wake up early, have your quiet time. You need to memorize this many verses a week. You need to pray for this long, and this is how to set up your prayer time. And you need to evangelize, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. And literally, I had a checklist on my, on my bed. It was like an Excel spreadsheet. I had, you know, quiet time, reviewed scripture memory, prayer time, shared the gospel with the lost. And, you know, and it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so, you know, I had seven days a week, and I had to tick every single one of those every day. And if I, and if I got to the end of a day and one of those check boxes wasn't ticked, oh, I felt so guilty. There were times, literally, I, I, was, I was not able to sleep, so I got up at two o'clock in the morning, started walking the halls till I could find somebody and I'd share the gospel with them. Not because I loved that person, just to get the guilt off my conscience so I could go to sleep in peace. So, I was doing my best to be disciplined. I was doing my best to live a committed life. And I thought, that's what the Christian life is. It's, it's me being committed to God. But how many of you know that religious people all around the world are doing that? Amen? <laughs> they, uh, they, are, they are living their life trying to obtain the blessings of God based on how devoted they are and the various things that they're doing. And they're all doing it on the basis of a book that they perceive to be from God. And the problem with me is that I was either doing pretty good at being disciplined and then I'd start judging people. You know, that weren't quite as disciplined as I was. You know, they started noticing that I was disciplined. I started noticing, you know, they started telling me about their problems. I was like, well, have you been having your quiet time and praying like this? And, and uh, you know, have you been, you know, oh, you, well, that's your problem. You know, so, you know, that, that, was their, that was their issues. And so I'd start judging them. Or I would start feeling defeated. So when you're living your life based on your own ability to be disciplined, you're either going to struggle with pride because you know that's coming from you, or you're going to struggle with, this, uh, with, with a defeated mindset. So one of the things that I've noticed since I've come into the revelation of our union with Christ, that it's not that you don't have discipline. It's not that you, uh, but the discipline is really disciplining yourself to participate in the life that you have in Christ. Amen? It's like that discipline that nobody gets really impressed with. Like, you know, I've been breathing for 46 years now. Every, you know, every few seconds, breath in, breath out. But none of you would go like, Man, you are so stinking disciplined. Your breathing is just like amazing, dude. You know, none of you know, I've been eating like three square meals a day every day of my life, but none of you would go like, man, you are so amazing. You eat every day, three times. Woo! You know, you wouldn't think that I'm really disciplined. You'd think you're just you're just receiving. You're just living. You're taking into you what you need to live. Amen? That is, that's the Christian discipline. That's when you realize that there is a divine life that's been put inside of you that actually receives life and that, you, that gives you life. And you, you begin to uh, allow the Spirit of God to saturate your inner man. And that's the Spirit of God 
actually has drives within within him drives for fellowship drives for love he's just this dna and so what i would like to propose to you the thing that really struck me is that the Christian life is more than getting forgiveness to get out of hell. It's more than going to church. It's more than conservative morality. Amen? It's more than improving your systematic theology. It's more than just being zealous for service. It's more than a new lifestyle. It's a new life form that's been put inside of you. It's the divine life of God put inside of your innermost being. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the life that raised Jesus from the dead came inside of you. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says, When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, you'll be revealed with Him in glory. Amen? The very life that was breathed inside of the womb of Mary, the life that came flowing out of this Jewish carpenter to heal the sick, to raise the dead, that empowered him to live such a life of fellowship with God, that life that could, uh, in time and space, actually interact and had the ability to see and taste and hear the Father. That life was the life that came inside of you and me to make us born again. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, said, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? When you're born again, you've got the life to see heaven. You can interact. You can taste and see that the Lord is good. He's not just a theory. You can actually experience God because He's living inside of you. He's giving you that ability. So when you receive Christ, you actually receive a a whole new life form living inside of you. And you become a brand new creation. What you were apart from that life is not what you are anymore. Once you receive the life of Christ inside of you, that becomes your life source and your identity and who you are. That's how the Father sees you. That's how God sees you. And that's who you really are. You used to be an eel. But now you're an electric eel. you got parts inside of you that are operating with powers that normal eels don't have. Do you understand that? You had a life form come into you. You and I were created as human beings to be the host of another life form. God created you and I to be containers of His life, to be participants in His life. So that we're not just participating in our own life apart from God, but we're actually participating in His own life. His thoughts flowing through our thoughts. His heart flowing in our heart. His will empowering our own. Amen? That's why when God says in in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, He says, let us make man in our image. Amen? Anybody read the Bible? Amen? Amen. We got to interact a little bit, okay? I ain't going to stand up here for three days hoping you guys are awake. Y'all got to come on with me, okay? Trains left. Be on board. All right, now, Jesus, God said this, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So God's intention when He created human beings is He was creating image bearers, people who now could participate in His life, bear and make Him, His invisible Spirit, visible. So that when they see us, when anyone sees us, they see what the invisible God looks like. Amen? Now, is there anybody here who's ever struggled with having a a low self-esteem or a bad self-image. You don't have to raise your hand. There's some people that that's very common. Amen. You do that. But I want to let you know something. This is this will be this will set you free if you really take it to heart. Okay? Because a lot of times people are trying to use the gospel so that they feel better about themselves. They're still trying to improve their self-image, you know? Oh, I wish I hadn't done that before and you know, I wish I didn't look this way. I wish I wouldn't have done those things and you've received some things into your heart and into your mind they didn't come from God and so you're trying to use what you're learning about the gospel to sort of prop that up so that you'll feel better about you I want to let you know something 
If you're trying to improve your self-image, you need to understand you were never meant to have your own self-image. You were created to have God as your image yes. so that you bear His image. Amen? Amen? And our problem is we came unplugged from God and we decided that we're going to be a light God. We're going to just be our own source of identity, our own source of power. The glove it may, is made in the image of a hand. Amen? Why? So that you can put the hand inside the glove. The glove was created to contain a hand. But you take the hand outside the glove, it's still made in the image of the hand, but you take the hand out and it, you can twist it into all kinds of shapes. Don't look anything like the hand. Amen? Amen. And you and I, when we came unplugged from God, we became twisted on the inside. We became filled with other things. The hand wasn't in there, so in our emptiness, we received other things that weren't true, that weren't God, that didn't give us life. The thief came to steal, to kill and destroy. Instead of being filled with light, we became filled with darkness. Instead of being filled with joy and peace, we became filled with shame and guilt and fear and anxiety and questions and doubts and selfishness and, and well, how, who's, who's she and who's he? And it just comes out of us. Because in the secret places, when we're unplugged from God, we have that same voice coming at us, right? The, the measure that we use to judge other people is coming back at us. And then when all of a sudden you realized, I was never created to have my own self-image. I was never created to be filled with myself. I was never created to, be, to contain sickness and disease and shame and guilt. I was created to contain God. My mind was created to create and contain the truth of God, the wisdom of God, my heart, the love of God, the desires of God, my will to express the will of God. Amen? So it's no longer me who lives. Christ is my life. Now, I'm not trying to look like Jesus apart from Him. I'm letting Jesus be my image. Amen. I'm letting Jesus be, be all that contain, that I contain. And so if it doesn't look like Him, if I didn't receive it from Him, I don't need it in me. It's not from Him. Amen. Heaven didn't give it to me. It's not true. It's lies. It's darkness. Amen. Now, this is the, when Jesus came, we got to see not only who we are, but we got to see who God is. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, I grew up, after I came to know Christ, a lot of the people that I hung around with, they were serious about following Jesus. But when it came to the supernatural, oh, that's a Jesus thing. He did those things. He healed the sick because he was trying to prove he was God. Uh, he was trying to demonstrate that God, that, that he and the Father were one. But if you listen to Jesus, that's not the explanation that he gives, is it? He says, it's not me doing my works. And I tell you, apart from... The Son can do nothing apart from the Father. So according to Jesus, being the divine Son of God did not give Him a special advantage Amen. to do miracles. He said the Son can do nothing apart from the Father. How many of you say, you know what, I really can't do miracles. Amen. You know what, Jesus said the same thing. I can't do miracles apart from my Father. My, it's not my humanity. It's not me being the Son of God. It's me being a man who's filled with the Father. It's my Father doing His works through me. I'm just bearing the image of someone else. I'm being what a human being was finally created to be. See, you and I, Jesus did not just die to get us out of hell. He died to buy us back to the Father. Amen. To buy us back to God's original intention. That's why it says in Galatians chapter 4, He said that God sent the Son at the fullness of time to redeem those who were born under the law. That's a good news, right? But I was always taught redemption meant that Jesus was paying an amazing price so that we wouldn't have to go to hell when we died. It includes that. But that's not the heartbeat of Scripture. But you need to understand something about redemption. Some of us struggle still with our self-image because we're so used to getting our worth 
even in our relationship with God, based on how good we're doing. Amen? And so you need to understand the redemption, uh, what that means. That even while you were yet a sinner, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Christ died for you. God was paying, Jesus was paying an amazing price in Christ. Now, a couple of, not a couple, several years back, I have, by the way, my name's Andy Hayner. <laughs> I live in Madison, Wisconsin with my wife and three children. You'll see them around. They're the ones helping me a lot this, this week. Um, and about several years back, um, my wife and I, we received a substantial gift. It was the largest financial gift that we had ever received. And we weren't even in ministry at the time. It was, it was from her, her parents. And so we were praying, God, what do you want us to do with this? And independently, God spoke to both of our hearts about adoption. And so we set out on a course to adopt a child into our family. Now, what ended up happening was about a year and a half later, we were selected by a birth mother to, uh, to receive a child. And by that time, this child was already one year old. His name was Zion. He was a little African-American boy who lived in uh, Georgia. And we were thrilled. Our whole family was thrilled. And um, the, what ended up happening, though, was a little bit tragic. But through this experience, God used it to give me a lot of revelation. How many of you know, sometimes, uh, God uses our life experiences to give us greater insight into the Word. Amen. And sometimes He'll use the Word to give us greater insight into the, to our life experiences. You know, God is an amazing teacher. Well, when, uh, when we first announced to our children that we were going to, to adopt, we told them we're going to have to tighten things up financially for a while because we've got a good start there, but we're going to have to save even more because lawyers are expensive and the adoption process involves a lot of lawyers. Um, and so we, we told them that we'd, we would have to start saving for this. Well, we got done with that family meeting, and it was the first time we had ever announced that. You know what happened? My 10-year-old son, at, he was... Was 10 years old at the time. He's 18 now. Um, he Maybe he was a little bit older. I'm, I'm terrible with timelines. My, my kids tell me, Dad, your stories are great, but your timelines are awful. So if I mess it up, just keep that in mind. Um, my son ran upstairs and came down with a peanut butter jar full of cash. You know what it was? It was the money that he had earned all summer long mowing an apartment complex's grass down the street. It was probably like 150, maybe 200 bucks. And for the adoption process, that didn't mean a whole lot financially. But he came down and he said, Dad, I get here, take this. The whole summer's worth of wet work. He knew what that was worth to him. And for him, that was like everything. And you know, that's exactly what happened for us. Is that the son and the father, they have this meeting to say, Hey, we're going to adopt them into the family. They're not going to come into the family as stepchildren, as foster children, as daycare children. That's not going to meet the, the, the desires of my heart. Son, the relationship that you have with me, I want to adopt them and give them that very same relationship with me. And the son says, oh yes, Father. And you know what? He didn't just come downstairs with a peanut butter jar full of cash. He came down to walk on this planet to hang on a cross for you and for me. Because that's how much the Father, that we mean to the Father and to the Son. Amen. 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 And so you need to understand, no matter what you've done, that this is how much you and every person that you ever meet is worth to God. This is how much. You went, I have a car, uh, I have a couple cars, and you know, and if my car gets in a wreck, the insurance company is going to make an evaluation. Should we just total the thing or should we repair it? You know, and if I, and if I decide that I'm going to repair the car and I'm going to pay that money, do you, know, do you understand that the wreck wasn't what defined the value of the car? The wreck just gave me an opportunity to demonstrate how much that car is worth to me. And you need to understand the wrecks that you and I have made with our lives. They do not diminish our value in the eyes of God. They actually give Him an opportunity to demonstrate. While you were yet a sinner, before you cared one thing about doing my will, before you cared a bit, this 
this much you are worth to me. I will hang on a cross for you. And you may think, uh, for some time, I had a hard time really feeling like that was some big sacrifice for God. I mean, because, you know, after all, He did rise back up after three days. So, you know, I mean, come on, you know, you die, come out the other side. You know, it's like swim in the water, you know, get up on the other bank, you know. And so I didn't really connect with this emotionally. But then you think about this. How many of you that have a children say, okay, you can get these other children out of slavery in Africa. You just let us torture your child for three days torture them. Any limits? No. We're going to give them the full deal. They may or may not live. And they're going to know you gave them to me. Yeah. So before you think that that wasn't a huge sacrifice, we need to all stop and humble ourselves. Amen? That God would pay such a high price for you and for me and for the people that we see and meet each day. He redeemed us. Why did He redeem us? Just to get us out of hell? Just to give us forgiveness? What does the Word say? He redeemed us to adopt us as sons. See, He's not just getting us out of hell. Yes, He's getting us out of hell. Amen? But He's getting us out of darkness and out of captivity and out of orphanage. And He's bringing us into the family as a son. He's bringing us out of shame and out of being alienated and out of being separated into the family as a son. Now, I used to think that I understood that. But I, I went through this adoption process and I realized something. How many of y'all have kids? Okay. Now, those, that you, those of you that don't have kids, you're going to have to take my word for this. Okay. When I got married, um, I loved my wife and I still do with all my heart. But something interesting, I had this weird experience when, when our first child was born and every child since then, uh, I have this overwhelming sense of, of loving this child. It comes out of nowhere and you cannot stop it. Uh, and you just realize, I remember feeling so vulnerable because this little child, you know, that you can hold like this, no bigger than a beanie baby, has totally got your heart wrapped around him. And how, how could this be? And, uh, and, and I remember telling my wife, I said, it's kind of weird, you know, because when we were dating, you know, and even when you're engaged, you know, I loved you and I loved you with all my heart. But there was kind of this evaluation process going on, you know, of, you know, she's the right one for me. She's going to get fat when she gets older, you know, you know, all these weird things that people are, are evaluating, you know, like, ooh, she kind of got an attitude. I wonder if I can handle that, you know, uh, kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, and, and then watching how she responds. And then all of a sudden you, you say, OK, I do. And we're in this for the long haul. But then you've got this child, and there's no evaluation whatsoever. I mean, whatever that little switch was, they were born with it on. You know, you didn't have to evaluate, well, am I going to love them or not? I mean, it's like, you know. And my kids, they bring their friends over to my house, but, and I love them, but there's parts of me they don't get because they're just not mine. You understand? And so I realized that there's this place reserved only for sons and daughters. That place where you get all of me. You get absolutely the best. And that, that you nobody can bless you without blessing me. Nobody can hurt you without it hurting me. Do you understand that we are one? You are an extension of me. And Jesus shows us what it's like to be fully alive and fully aware and fully awake to the Father's love. This is what it looks like to live as a son. To know that the Father is with me. To know that the Father loves me. And Jesus earned it. And Jesus deserved it. But you know what? He did something amazing. He earned it not just for Himself. He earned it for you and for me. So that we would be adopted. Not like Cinderella and be that, oh, that stepchild. I realized something. I didn't have son love and adopted son love. All I had was son love, and I had adopted little Zion into that place. That as soon as he came into our family, he stepped right into that place, and I loved him as my own with everything that was in me. Amen? Amen. And he didn't have to earn it. He didn't have to earn it. 
It wasn't something he was on trial or probation for. It was something that was simply given. Do you know that when my child, my children were born, they didn't come out smart, good looking. They came out basically doing nothing. You know, they, they could poo, pee, <laughs> scream, <laughs> cry, need to be fed, go to the bathroom, you know, that, I mean, wake us up. They didn't do anything really that that benefited us or contributed to the family. They came in with a huge bill, you know, that we had to pay. But I didn't even think about that, you know. It, it, why did I love them? Because they're mine. My life is in them. My, my DNA, they're mine. And do you know, as soon as you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were born again. God put the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you and He adopted you and said, the, I am giving to you the very same relationship with me that Jesus has. He earned it, but He earned it for you. You don't have to earn it. I'm adopting you there by grace and no you know what i paid an amazing price for it that's what redemption means that jesus wasn't just paying for our forgiveness he was paying adoption fees he was paying so that you could come into the house as a son as a daughter so that no one could ever take you away jesus said that in, in john chapter 10 he said no one can snatch you out of my hand amen and we had that terrible experience after about a month and a half, I got a nervous phone call from the adoption agency because it turned out that the birth mother had lied, that the birth father actually had been involved in Zion's life and did want to father him. And she was estranged from him and was lying to the adoption agency. And so after three months, unfortunately, we had to relinquish Zion and to give Zion back. And we went through like a death in the family. Our kids were broken hearted. I was broken hearted. My wife was broken hearted. We we cried for months. We cried for months. But the whole time, God was with us. And the whole time, God was strengthening us. And, and He was showing us about His heart. And, uh, you know, he, I don't believe He did that to us. I believe lies are from the, the enemy. But you know what? God it was with us. God was with us. And His grace is sufficient no matter what we go through. Um, and so part of the, what I want you to understand is this, that many times Christians are trying to earn their place in the house. They're trying to maintain their place in the house like they're on probation. And it gives them a spirit of slavery because they're living by this fear of rejection. Have I done enough to get blessed? Have I done enough to be used? Have I, am I smart enough? Do I know the Bible enough? Do I have this or that? You need to understand that God gives you the relationship and the standing with Him as a son. It's given to you. Jesus earned it for you. Most Christians are doing what I call, they're making this mistake, they're basing their relationship with God on their walk with God. Instead of basing their walk with God on their relationship with God. Amen. Now, here's, here's the difference. If I, if I were to take you out, if we went out to lunch today and I hadn't had this sermon, and I just kind of, you know, asked you a trick question up front and said, hey, tell me about your relationship with God. You might start telling me, well... Sometimes I struggle to wake up in the morning and I got to get off to work and I got kids when I get home. And, you know, I, I do listen to the Bible on CD when I drive around and I pray in tongues. And, you know, I don't know, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. You know what you just told me? You didn't tell me anything about your relationship with God. You just told me that you're basing your relationship with God on your walk with God. So when your walk is up, you feel like, okay. God can use me. He could do a miracle through me today. All right, yeah, I got this. You know, I've been praying in tongues. I've been, been memorizing the Word, been speaking, you know. And I'm ready. I'm ready. What you got? Come on, devil. Bring it on, you know. Now you, why? You feel confident, but you feel confident because you're basing your walk with God on your relation, your relationship with God on your walk. Well, what happens when, you know, the kid wakes up early and you get up and there's no coffee and he's still, you know, got this attitude and, and that kind of thing and then you see somebody needs needs healing or you get the bills in the mail oh what did I do you know God's trying to discipline me or something like that and they say, oh I need to you know tithe and get you know get things and you're basing your your relationship with God on your walk with God most Christians have this list of things that they feel like they're basing their relationship with God on it's really their walk 
and they don't feel like they're doing really good at it. And so the worst thing we could do is just add healing and prophecy and evangelism to the bottom of that list of all the things you think you stink at. Amen? You don't want to do that. What you want to do is get rid of that list. Not that you don't do them, but that that's not what I base my relationship with God on. What I base my relationship with God on is that God has given me as a gift the relationship that Jesus has with Him so that I can enjoy His relationship with the Father as my relationship with the Father. I can't mess up the relationship between the Father and Jesus Christ, but through the Holy Ghost and by faith, I can actually participate in it. I can step into it and I can enjoy the way that the Father looks at the Son, the way that the Father treats the Son, the favor that the Father has for the Son, that that's now extended to me and I get to participate in that. Amen? Now, when I got engaged, my wife's family is a little bit more white collar, mine a little bit more blue collar. I wasn't really secure around people that had more money than me and, you know, knew how, which fork to use, you know, when you sit down at one of these fancy meals and stick their little pinkies out and that kind of stuff. I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't like that. I, you know, I didn't know that there were some towels in the bathroom you weren't supposed to wipe a muddy hands on. I, I had no idea. If it was a towel in the bathroom in our house, it, so they were glad if I ever used it, you know, when I was growing up. And, uh, and, when when we first when I first met her parents they treated me with grace and with favor what had they done they had extended to me they had incorporated me so that I got to participate in the favor that they had for their daughter. It was the same thing for my family. First time my dad ever met my, my fiancé at the time, wife now, he came running out the front door and gave her a great big hug. He never met her before in his life. What had he done? He had chosen to extend the love he has for me to my beloved. Amen? And so he was treating us as one. Do you know when we got married, my wife... She had a really cool Jeep Cherokee. And I had a small student loan and a Chevette. When we got married, my student loan became our student loan. And her Jeep became our Jeep. <laughs> Do you understand that? That when Jesus Christ hung on the cross and walked and became flesh, He was becoming one with us. He was taking responsibility for everything that Adam's race ever had done or ever could do to offend the Father. And He was living on our behalf a perfectly righteous life for the Father. But He was already righteous, but now He was living His life for us, for you and for me on our behalf. And He was dying on the cross for us, for you and me on our behalf so that that though he was rich he became poor so that we through his poverty might be made rich amen so that our unrighteousness he became sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Amen? Amen? That's amazing to me. That's what Jesus has done. He's made us sons. Do you know that if you are born again, that you are every much a son of God or a daughter of God as Jesus Christ is a son of God? Amen. He was that way by nature. You and I got renatured. Amen? He, he, God made us one with Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says this, that, that, when, uh, that if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are one spirit with Him. Now that's amazing. Because that's what made Jesus amazing. Amen? I mean, it wasn't that he had better education than everybody else. He didn't have more money than everybody else. He didn't have more muscles than anybody else. Did he? He had a different spirit than everyone else. He had a spirit that was one with his Father. Amen? And now you're one with Jesus Christ. It's kind of like this, that Jesus, you know those old timey PCs, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, back when it was optional, if they had the ability to connect the, to the internet, they might just be able to do like word processing, Excel spreadsheets, that kind of stuff. And... Uh, 
and they were clunky, really clunky, worse than they are today. You, they'd freeze up all the time. And it was like humanity was kind of like those old-timey PCs. Everybody's running the same software, same issues, freezing up, never working properly. And then Jesus comes along, and we see something altogether different flowing through Him. It was YouTube videos, man. It was, it was live streaming HD movies, you know. And He says, it's not me, it's my Father. He was healing the sick. He was loving. He was, he was living a life totally devoted to God, but he didn't look religious. He wasn't judgmental. He was merciful. He was compassionate. It wasn't like he went to the temple or went to to the synagogue to to meet God. It was like wherever Jesus was, the Father was with him. And it looked like heaven. So when people were hurting, he, he was able to help them because God was with him. He was like a walking temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And he said, it's not me. I'm just live streaming my Father. I'm live streaming my Father. I'm like a monitor screen. And what you're seeing in me is my Father flowing through me, living in me. I'm speaking the things that He's pouring into me. I'm just live streaming Him. But then He said this. He said, I'm going to die and rise again and I'm going to become a Wi-Fi and you're going to be able to start live streaming the Father because, you're going to, uh, because I've downloaded all this onto my server and I'm giving you the access code. You need to start, stop running your old programs. Stop running your old stuff. Amen? And start live streaming me. The mind, start live streaming the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the identity of Christ. Because all those things that make you feel bad about you, guess what? God does not feel bad about you. Those things that you think God feels bad about, they were crucified 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ took the old Jew on to, into Himself upon the cross and you were crucified in Jesus Christ. You need to understand that it wasn't just Jesus that died on that cross. You died. Amen. He didn't just die for your sin. He died as you, the sinner. Amen. He died in your place representing you. And the Father looked at the Son and said, yes, you represent them to me. And so when Christ died, all died. Amen. Amen? Amen? So that thing that you think that God's all worried about, that thing that you want to be free from, you need to understand you are free. Yes. Death, dead people are free from the law. Amen. Dead people. You know, debt collectors stop chasing people when they die. <laughs> Amen? Amen. They, there, there's, there's no debt collectors running around in graveyards. <laughs> Is there? You know what? And there's not even any rules in the graveyards. They don't say, y'all don't snore so loud. You know? Or, you know, no way. Everybody be back in their own coffins by 9 uh, p.m. You know, there's no law that that has anything to do with dead people. The law has to do with Adam's race, the unrighteous sinners. Uh, though it, it, but it doesn't have to do with us because when we died, we died to the law. Why? So, so that we could be lawless? No. So that we could contain the life of God and let that life have dominion inside of us. So that the life and the love and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what reigns in us. Amen. You know, Jesus just came and He just did whatever He wanted to do. That's what He did. He did, the, but what He wanted to do was the Father's will. That's the way a righteous person lives. That's the way a son lives. I'm just loving my father. It's not hard to love him. His commands are not burdensome. I mean, his commands are love the father and love everyone else as much as yourself. I mean, it would be terrible if God's commands were like, you know, hate me and, and be a grumpy puss. You know? I mean, if that's the way God wanted it, He could have just, you know, just, just be depressed. <laughs> you know, I mean, He could have just given us stuff that seemed easy to our old man. But He gave us awesome commands. Love me and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. See, Jesus called, those things were called signs when Jesus did that. Amen? But they were signs pointing to a life that was operating inside of Him 24-7. And we don't want to just be people that are doing miracles trying to make up for a lack of relationship. 
Or we don't want to be people that feel like, unless I did my miracle today, that God might not love me. Jesus wasn't insecure trying to do all these things, hoping that God might finally love him. Or that if he stopped, if he got off the hamster wheel, that all of a sudden, that, you know, it's over. He was not living like a slave. Do you understand that when the prodigal son returned home, the father ran to him and threw a great big party and said, This is my beloved son. Let's throw a party. He didn't say, This is my beloved son. Son, thank God, now we can get the barn built. Do you understand? The father didn't love the son for the work that he got out of him. The father loved the son because the the son was my son. This is my beloved son. I want the relationship. Now that relationship then, he makes the son an owner. So he works, but he doesn't work like a slave. See, if a slave stops working, you know, hey, I don't feel like working today. The master just says, all right, I don't feel like feeding today. You know, it's a transactional relationship. Sons work, don't they? The father works, doesn't he? But you know what? Sons work out of rest. I was just reading in the Old Testament today, and I'm going to close up with this. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of work there's a lot of grace that we see in the law, and the sacrificial system is pretty amazing. Because so often you have entire chapters of the Old Testament where God's giving the law. Some of them are like you know, don't eat this, do this, don't do that. But then other of them are talking about the whole the priesthood and the sacrificial system. And today what I read in there was amazing. It said, now, don't do any work, but I want you to offer this sacrifice and offer it by fire. And it'll be a soothing aroma. And I'm like, that's exactly it. You know what? The sacrifice and the fire does the work. The sacrifice and the fire does the work. Because if you can't get the the do's and the don'ts right, guess what? There's the sacrifice and the fire, and that does all the work. That pleases the Father. That's what works, and it's got to be in an image bearer. You've got to have a priest. You've got to have somebody putting their hands on the sacrifice for it to be offered. Amen? You offer the fire. You offer the sacrifice. And that's all that Jesus is. He is everything that that pleases the Father. And when you receive Christ, you received 100% righteousness. You received 100% fire. Amen? And for us is learning how to offer that back to the Father. How to let Christ be the life that we live by. We're not trying to use Him to fix us. He's fixed. He's new. And we get to learn to ride this. So I'm going to tell one story. We're going to be done for this session. I uh, once was sharing this with a friend of mine, and uh, he was having a hard time getting it. He's, he said things like this. He said, so, we're at a coffee shop. He said, so, you know, if I go over there and, like, steal all those muffins, and, and they try to arrest me, you know, and you're saying I can just say, hey, this is not me. This is not my identity. This is my old man. Don't arrest me. I said, no, no, no. I didn't say that. that you, what, you know, that's dumb. You see, grace is given to us so that we can live in Christ, not so that we can live in sin. Right? We don't, we don't live in sin. That's how slaves live. Son lives like Jesus. They live in the fellowship of the Father. And so there was a point where he said, hey, I think I just got it. And I said, really? He said, and he said, yeah, let me share it with you. And I said, okay. He said, when I was growing up, my dad was a deadbeat. He was a terrible father. My mom and dad got divorced. One summer, um, I was uh, told that I needed to go live with my father. I wasn't too thrilled about it. My mom, at that time, I was really into BMX bike racing, but my mom would not let me take my best bike to go at my dad's house. But my dad had this old beater Pee Wee Herman bike, you know, the ones with the big, you know, 90 inch wheels and, the, you know, and, and it was out, but it was out behind the, the shed, and so it had even rusted. So it was not only a Pee Wee Herman bike, but it was an old jalopy Pee Wee Herman bike. It had the triangle seat with the springs and stuff. And so he said, I spent all summer like bartering for jobs. I got a new paint job, exchanged the seat, got new handlebars. Finally, towards the end of the summer, I start riding this thing uh, around the block, and guess what? A tire popped. And so I walk it back to the house, and my dad says, uh, and that weekend, I was supposed to go on this thing that my mom had arranged for me. 
And so I'm getting ready to pack up to go. My dad asked me, he said, son, is there anything I can do for you, get for you while you're out this weekend? And he said, well, dad, I've been working on this bike this whole time and I don't have much time in the summer when I get back. I'd love it if I could just ride it. So if you could find you know, a way to fix the tire, that'd be amazing. And the dad said, I got it. And he said right then when my dad said that, you know, I had a hard time trusting my dad because he didn't come through for a lot of things. But I kept my heart open. I said, you know, okay, let's see, you know. I got back Sunday afternoon, got out of the car, and right there in the garage, the garage door was open, and I looked in there, and there was my bike right where I had left it. Tire still flat, had not been touched. And he said, I got out of that car, and I was so mad, I was so hurt, I was angry, I got my bag, I ran in stairs, I was going upstairs, I just wanted to fling myself in my room, because I, I didn't want to see my dad at that point. I was halfway between crying and wanting to punch him. And so I flung open my door, and there in the middle of my bedroom, was a brand new top of the line BMX racer. And he said it's the first time I remembered, you know, crying tears of joy. And uh and I said, "Man, that's amazing." I, you know, and then I asked him a question. So, what does this have to do with what I've been sharing with you? And he goes, "This whole time I've been looking at the Christian life like trying to fix up the old bike." And I realized that sometimes I was getting discouraged and frustrated because I felt like God wasn't helping me. And the whole time, I re- now I realize God's given me Christ, and He's given me, and it's He's whole and He's complete, and He's not wanting to. And He said, and He, and this is what He said. He said, "I never took the tire off the new bike to put it on the old one. I just learned to ride the new bike, and I never got on that old one again." And I said. Dude, that's exactly right. We need to learn that Christ is perfect. He's complete. And God has given Christ to us to be our relationship with Him. To be our spirit. To be our fullness. To be our life. And for us, it's not using Christ to patch up something old. The old is gone. The old man is crucified. We are simply learning how to contain Him. To participate in Him. To let Him be the life that we live by. And to live in His mind. To live in His heart. To live in his will and I told him I said man I'm stealing it I'm putting my book and I'm going to use it and he said okay and I said but the only thing that could make this a more perfect real illustration is, is if your dad had gotten you a Harley. <laughs> because Jesus comes with power. Amen? <laughs> you don't have to pedal Him down the street. Amen? And so, brothers and sisters, let's, let's learn how to participate, how to ride the Harley, how to let Christ be the power and the, the relationship and the stability. Learn how to sit ourselves on that seat. Amen? That's altogether different than trying to fix up your old bike. So let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back here uh, in 10 minutes, and we'll start in on a session to learn how can we participate in this and begin to make this our daily experience, and how can we share this with others so that we can help them as well. Amen.